Welcome everyone to New Bedford Creative, where we go behind the scenes and meet the people who make New Bedford creative. I'm your host, Margot Saulnier. I'm the creative strategist for the city of New Bedford. Today, we are going to venture to the south end of New Bedford to Kilburn Mill at Clark's Cove and visit the New Bedford Children Creative Resource Center. We'll venture up to downtown where we'll meet DATMA and their public art exhibition. And finally, we'll meet Eric Lintela, who's a sculpture artist who had an exhibit at the College of Visual and Performing Arts at UMass Dartmouth. I am here with Marissa Faye Martin, who is the Executive Director for New Bedford Children, and we are so excited to be here today, Marissa. Thank you for hosting us. I'm so glad that you guys could come and be here with us. So I would love to hear about the inspiration for creating a space like this. It's just so amazing. Can you tell us about it? Yeah, so this space is kind of a little bit of many different places that I've been. A place in Denver, there's a place in the city of Reggio Emilia, Italy, there's a place in Cranston, Rhode Island, and then also, you know, a little bit of classrooms that I've been in. And so I pulled a little bit from all of these different sources to make this space, which is very unique. I don't think I've ever seen anything quite like this place, so. So you've literally taken inspiration from all over the world, including some local places. And tell us about how, you know, who is this for? Who's the audience? Who's coming here? What do you do here? Yeah, so this space is designed specifically for early childhood educators. This is a, a place for them to come and feel supported and to get ideas and materials for their classrooms. I want them to feel like they're home when they're here. This is created special for them. That's so amazing. So we are standing in basically an art studio yeah. right now. Mm -hmm. So what are the kind of things that um, that the early childhood educators, and, and just for our audience, early childhood education is what ages primarily? Um, infants through age six. Okay, great. And so these are educators working with that age group. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as we all know, uh, being creative is an all ages activity, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, here in the art studio, what kind of things would you be discussing or teaching or reviewing with the educators? So we like for the, the environment itself in the center to be a teacher in its own way. So we generally have a different um, setup on the table for teachers to feel invited to come over and participate in, the same way that I would set up in the classroom. And so um, they're actively engaging and playing the same way the child does. And so they're gaining that, the insights of that experience to understand their students better. And then they also have lots of materials that they can bring back to their classroom with them. We've got oil pastels, paints, colored pencils, crayons, markers, um, glue, so much paper, like all different kinds of papers and colors of paper and everything. It's great. So can you actually demonstrate? We have on the table here, it's what do you observe, see, touch, smell? Yeah. So this is a, a setup that I've actually done with my pre-K students in the past. Um, I offer just a piece of white paper and a Sharpie on the table and then different materials uh, from nature for them to look at uh, with magnifying glasses. And sometimes I even use a digital microscope set up to a computer so that they can zoom in on different parts of the um, dragonfly or, um, or um, I'm not sure what these that are that came from a tree, but I was just told that they're chestnuts. Oh. I don't actually know. <laughs> so anyway, um, I had ones like this that were very spiky in my last classroom, and my students would sit and it says, what do you observe? So they can touch it, they can look at it very closely, they can smell it, and then they, and then they draw a picture of it. And so um, when I'm pretending to draw like a child, I tend to use my left hand. And I've watched them draw so many times that I kind of like know what they're drawing, especially like this. I've 
I've literally watched them draw these before. So, you know, they'll be looking at it and then they, different children express the texture on it different ways. Sometimes they'll make lines going out, sometimes they make circles and then coming out. Uh, yeah, so you can see I added on the stem, and then I might ask the children what they think this is. Uh, we might have found this together on one of our walks, and they can um, add their own hypotheses, and then we might look through a book of trees to see if we can figure it out. So while the children are doing this, I would be sitting next to them, as you are next to me, Margo, and I would be writing down all of the things that they're telling me and then I would be taking photos of them while they're drawing and then afterwards of the two next to each other. And then this is um, what we call documentation that we would share with families later um, so that they can see how the children are learning and engaging throughout the day. This um, particular piece of beehive has been to different schools with me before and so we've looked in, inside all of those little and sometimes there's little pieces of dead bees. It's, <laughs> it's really fun. So you mentioned technology. Can we explore other ways you use technology here at the Creative Resource Center? Yes. Um, so one of my favorite pieces of technology to use with young children is a digital projector and many people think you would just watch um, YouTube videos for kids, but we actually use it to create digital environments. Um, so say it's a rainy day outside and we want to bring the rain into the classroom, we can project a video of rain. Or if the children are playing with um, toy sea animals, we can project um, an aquarium up on the wall and the children can engage with it as if they're um, in the water. Awesome. Is yeah. that something you can show, show me now? Um, sure. All right, let's go. So we're now standing in front of this beautiful digital environment of an aquarium. Um, how did you set it up and what do you recommend teachers do? So this is what I call a provocation. It's like an invitation for the children to come and play. The way that it's set up is um, invokes ideas that the child might have coming into it and then is open-ended for whatever they want to play um, versus just giving them the bin of toys and just saying, here you go. And also including the books is a great way to work literacy into your classroom. Um, I've had students like sit there and look at the books and then pretend to be those animals it's really great to see the children like interacting. So um, normally when I'm in a classroom, we set these up at the beginning of the day before the children arrive. And then in the afternoon, we might set it up after, um, after the children wake up for nap or um, snack, usually during a transition where the children are um, with one teacher, like such as during a meeting time is a great time to set up provocations in your room. And you showed me this really cool thing that you do shadow puppets or use shadows so the students can go right up and see themselves reflected in the aquarium. Yep. I think this is so amazing. Yep, and they're learning about light and the properties of light and they learn that when they go close, closer to the light source, it's bigger and when they go further back, it's smaller. Really Children cool. are like scientists, they learn by experimenting. This is using the webcam and there's many different ways of using the webcam. One way would be to have it down with the materials on the table so all the children are playing, they can see their hands and their toys projected up on the wall. Mm -hmm. But this right here is one of my very favorite things. Um, it's called a feedback loop and you can see your hand going off into the distance. And children love this. They'll run back and forth going, somebody's chasing me. Or they'll be like, there's a million of me. And I just love to take the notes of everything that children say when they experience this very novel thing. Oh, <laughs> You're smiling. So it's so much fun, right? <laughs> it is. I told her this was my worst nightmare. But no, there's this a is fun. of you, Margo. <laughs> <laughs> I don't need a million of me. <laughs> So tell me about this section. What do, what do we do here? So this is a sort of dramatic play provocation. 
Uh, we offer a lot of unusual materials here at the center um, that, you know, if you've never worked in this way before, you might not understand how they could be used in your classroom. So this is an example of how you might use many of the materials in your dramatic area, play area. Oftentimes when you're in the classroom, you'll see um, a plastic cucumber. And you know, um, that plastic cucumber can only be a cucumber. But when you offer children materials like this, this could be a hamburger, it could be a plate, it could be a piece of chocolate, like there's just endless, whatever the children use their imagination for it to be. So it really increases creativity. Those are sausages or, I don't know. <laughs> I like this, this is my chocolate bar. <laughs> Perfect. So I love this area. It seems like a little shop to me. Can you, what is this and how do you, how do the teachers use it? Yeah, so this area of the room is for the shopping for the materials that they can bring back to their room. And so these are the kind of things that you find throughout the room and the kind of examples. And this is where you get like the raw stuff. So we have these bags that actually come from a company in the mill, they get rid of them. And so um, teachers can come around and select whatever materials they want for their bag. Um, and then we also have choke tubes available. So if a teacher teaches infants, they can use one of these to see if the materials are a choking hazard. So if it fits inside the tube, it is a choking hazard and it can't go in their classroom. But if it doesn't fit, then it's safe and they can bring it back to their room. Where do they come from? So most of these materials are donated from different sources. These come from tile companies and flooring, so they're uh, examples of what the laminate flooring or countertops would look like. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have buttons. These are buttons that were donated by members of the community. We've been having a lot of people come by and just dropping off bags of things. And what are the tubes on the floor here? So these tubes came from a manufacturing company here in the mill actually that creates belts. And so these come with the thread on them. And then once all of the thread is gone, they're left with these. Um, before I started asking for them, they were just throwing them away. So. Wow. So a lot of upcycled materials yeah. here are, are perfect for, yeah. yeah, that's great. So this work is not only great for the classroom, it's also great for the environment. And how does it work when teachers come in? What is, do you have a membership? Does it cost anything? Yeah, so we do have memberships and because of the grant, we were able to give every early childhood teacher in the city a free membership. So when they come in, they get their membership card, fill it out, and we put them in the system. And then they get pretty much everything for free. The workshops are free. It's great. Wow. So you have workshops. They can come and learn about the different materials. Can they go shopping for free or does that cost something? Nope, that's free too. And they can take out books from our library. Awesome, that's so great. I'm loving this library here, very creative. And it's clear to me that it's been curated by you. So how, how do you choose the selections that are here? So when I decide if a book is uh, great for our library, I'm thinking about the characters inside the books and the um, topics and themes. I really want for children to be able to see themselves inside the books as a sort of mirror, but then at the same time we need windows to see other people and other cultures. Thank you so much, Marissa, for giving us a tour of this amazingly creative space. I'm wondering, can the general public come in or is this primarily for teachers? It's primarily for teachers, but people are welcome to come in. We're in the mill, so people are constantly walking by and going, what is this? And I welcome them in and they take a look around and um, always leave excited. So. Excellent. And if anyone has any donations, materials to donate, yes. or are you looking for anything in particular? Um, 
you never know what's going to be a good fit for the center. So give us a message and we'll see if it, if it works. Great. Thank you so much. Yep. Hi, I'm Amanda Hawkins. I am the program coordinator with DATMA. We are downtown here in New Bedford installing our three public exhibitions that are launching today. We, um, we have photography exhibitions, sound installations, and more, honoring a lot of local um, photographers and UMass Dartmouth um, research scientists. And we also have international artists from Switzerland having a sound installation at the Star Store. So we're very excited to have all these exhibitions launching today. and hope everyone comes to see them. Hi, my name is Alex Gavush. I am a graduate of Vogue Tech, uh, class of 2021, and I'm in here, here today installing these art pieces. Uh, these, are, these are inspired by the old uh, sailmaking and shipbuilding pictures that are found in the Whaling Museum, and they are, are more modernized to feature some of our hardworking women in the trades all around the world. Our job here was to create the aluminum frames for these pieces. Our aluminum frames were made primarily by the, uh, the welding class uh, at, at Great New Bedford Oak. And uh, we spent almost uh, 500 hours, over 500 hours actually, uh, constructing these frames. Uh, we today have our students here, sophomore students as well as freshmen, uh, donating time to help uh, install these pieces, uh, doing some of their civic duty after school hours. So we're really grateful for them to coming out and helping us. And uh, this could not be done without uh, our wonderful instructors and the help of DATMA as well. And uh, we love being part of this, so thank you very much to them. I'm Lindsay Meesh and I'm Executive Director of Massachusetts Design Art Technology Institute, also known as DATMA. And I'm here down at New Bedford's waterfront to review a show called Harvesters of the Deep, Fisherwomen from Scotland, South Korea, and the United States. And our United States exhibition portion is covering New Bedford specifically. And uh, we wouldn't be able to have such a conversation through art without someone who really is part of the fishing industry, but also looking at it through a lens. And uh, we were lucky to be able to find Phil Mello through our friends at the Fishing Heritage Center. And uh, Phil Mello, he is a, a native of the area and also um, knows firsthand about uh, what's going on in the fishing industry. So please allow me to introduce you to Phil Mello. Uh, thank you so much for introducing me. Uh, this has been a great project, a fun one to start with. I'm very honored to be part of it. Um, and I'm honored to be along with these great photographers from all over the country uh, and all over the world. Um, my project started actually uh, in 2008. Uh, I, I would go to the New Bedford Whaling Museum and I'd see these photographs of back in the whaling days and how you'd see the barrel makers and the um, sail makers and the people who work in the shipyards. And I said, you know, here in the fishing industry now we have the same type of community, uh, people that are making uh, uh, the boats, people that are uh, welders, people that are uh, tallyers for the uh, the auction. So it, it's uh, a kind of a project that I've been ongoing since uh, 2008 and, and, and on today and uh, very happy that Dat Datmer has invited me to uh, participate in this, uh, this show. So here are a few photos that I did. Uh, this one is Mary Hughes. She's a fish sampler and what a fish sampler does is they take the fish that's coming right off the boat, they measure it, they take a uh, sample of the scales, and they uh, send it all to the National Marine Fisheries, and they report where the boat fished. So it's important to see how the fish are migrating, how the fish are growing in that certain area. This photo right here is of Mariana. Mariana works at Burgey Seafood. And the time I took this picture, she was working in the plant. Uh, Mariana came here from um, Guatemala, 
and she started working in the plant when she was 16. Things changed. She would do every job in the plant. She knew how to cut fish. She knows how to pack the fish. She knows how to put particular orders up. And um, eventually we had an opening in the office. So I told the owners of the company, I said, I'm going to bring her from the floor in the office because she knows the whole operation. And now she's a salesperson at, at Burgess Seafood. I believe she's 26 years old now. And she has a, a family here. And she's one of the hardest workers I, uh, we have there at the plant. So we're in front of a piece by artist Zimun from Bern, Switzerland, and it's called 280 Prepared DC Motors, Cotton Balls, and 13 by 13 by 13 Cardboard Boxes. And uh, the first iteration of the piece was in 2011, and here it is installed in a new form, 2021. So it's a piece that's just had many different lives. And uh, one thing that really attracted us to Zimun's work was his choice of materials and how accessible they are in every day. You know, we've got these cotton balls that um, are different mallets to percussion instruments. We have these really basic motors and then the cardboard box. And, uh, you know, by exploring different materials, uh, we just were so captivated by the fact that it really goes to show that, you know, if you approach a material or, or uh, with an artistic, with an artistic creative uh, intention, that anything can be art. Hello, everyone. I'm here at the University of Massachusetts Dartmouth's College of Visual and Performing Arts, the Star Store campus in downtown New Bedford, and we are here at Gallery 244, and I'm excited to introduce you to Eric Lintela, who has taught here for many, many years, and we're here to learn more about his sculpture and the source of his material and how he creates these amazing artworks that are here in the gallery as well as outside in New Bedford. Eric, can you tell us about your exhibition here? Uh, it's a combination of photographs and sculptures. The photographs represent all the sources of inspiration. Uh, in which I've created these works, which mostly are of uh, metal, bronze, steel, and also as well fiberglass and some wood. Um, the photographs themselves, I've taken myself on the journeys that are mostly uh, in the American Southwest for the past, good Lord, at least almost 40 years going out there. Very curious, Eric, as to the the hazards and the source material that you came along the way. Can you give us a little glimpse into the a story of of how this sculpture was created? Uh, this sculpture is called Close Call in Canyon Lands, and the image are of two hands, and those are actual casts of my hands, with emphasis on my lifelines. And as you can see the imagery, we have this figure with the horns pointing at my one lifeline. And here you see another shaman type image that has a head of an owl with a bird flying overhead. <clears throat> this one with the bird overhead emphasizes life and this is death. Okay, I want to about this one here. This image is a detail of the white shaman shelter. This is on the Pecos River, that's in Texas, just off of the Rio Grande. And it's one of the most famous pictograph sites, which are paintings in the cave walls in Texas. And this depicts a floating shaman 
with uh, a magic wand and he's what is said he's trying to bring on the spirituality of bringing water to the tribe to the crops to the village the title of this work is called question of balance and i would love to hear the story behind this piece now this piece comes directly uh, from a rock art carving that i saw in arizona so you have a crane here the image that was in its beak but the crane obviously to them was standing in the water so i I wanted to try something different, so I thought about the transparency of water, and I'm thinking about steel eye beams again. So I cut the legs out in the negative, which represents underwater, and you have the water line and coming through the holes of the legs, and he's standing in a pond, just as you see many of the blue cranes and herons that exist out here in the bogs and stuff. The two photographs here are of shaman uh, that are in Seminole Canyon, which is in South Texas along the Rio Grande. What you have here on the left is the blue shaman with wings. And this figure is about two and a half feet tall. He's got very subtle lines that are depicted extended from his arms with feathered, feathered areas that seem to float into space. And he himself is floating, as you can just see how his feet are splayed and the toes are pointed downward. The same type of an image that's in the same canyon, we have the yellow shaman who has a magical staff and his spirit uh, figures that are off to the right. Uh, both of these shaman, again, are images of shamans that the indigenous tribes look to them to find that balance in life. These two photographs, uh, they're both titled The Ghost Panel, and this is in Sago Canyon in the middle of Utah. And as you can see from these figures, they're very ominous. They have large, circular, open eyes. And they're all just, they're large. These are life-size figures, seven to eight feet tall. And a lot of times they've been written about as the uh, infamous aliens that came to this planet long ago and had inspired man in some way, shape, or form. People saw things back then. And what they saw, God only knows. But they're haunting. Some of them are very beautiful. Some are scary. Um, but one has to really think, what were they experiencing for them to have created such imagery as these godlike figures, space-type figures? God only knows who these spiritual beings are. So that's what I've been trying to capture in all of my works, and that is where the white cylinders have come from, that then my images surmount them, because I was trying to, how do you elevate your thought, your image, to such a level that brings that experience and it's putting them on a let's say a high pedestal and the pedestals are usually tapered and they're white and that's just that uplifting spiritual concept i've been thinking about and then i surmount my images that i depict from what i experience from what they've de uh, derived and what they might mean and i come up with some a lot of times these my own images these there are very few images I create that are duplicated from what's on the walls, but a lot of these are based on my own experiences that I've had out there. Well, thank you, Eric, so much for uh, giving us the like, behind the scenes view into your work. And it's just an inspiration to see it here in at the College of Visual and Performing Arts, as well as out on the streets and parks of New Bedford. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Thank you. <laughs>